So let's talk about titrations or volumetric analysis as it's also called. So uh, the idea behind volumetric analysis is that uh, we, can, we can use that to find this, a certain amount of substance, either concentration or percent by mass, uh, by doing a titration. And a titration is a technique. Okay, uh, You take uh, a solution with a known concentration and you add it to an amount of solution that you're going to be analyzing. Okay, the, the terms titrant and analyte are important. It's important that you understand the difference between them. The titrant is the thing you know. Okay, you very accurately know the concentration of the titrant. It's usually something that you have determined either previously uh, by a particular method called standardization, or it's a bottle solution that you bought specifically for titration where the concentration is printed on the label and you know it very, very accurately. Okay, The analyte, that's the solution you don't know much about. Okay, you probably know what it is. You, you kind of have to know what it is in order to do titration. Um, but you don't know its concentration. You don't know if it's got impurities in it or, or any of that. Uh, titration techniques are used frequently in practical applications of science. Um, for everything from environmental science to industri industrial analysis. So we're going to do some basic titrations and see how we can use the technique in a lot of different situations. Okay. Uh, what we're looking for in titration is we're doing, a, we're doing a chemical reaction and we're looking to reach the point at which we have equal number of moles of reactants present. Now that doesn't mean um, the same number of moles. That means based on the stoichiometry of the equation. So depending on what the stoichiometry says, if it's a 2 to 1 mole ratio of reactants, then we want, we want to reach exactly that ratio. Okay, uh, we can't typically see the equivalence point because most of these solutions are going to be colorless. Now, there's some exceptions to that if we do certain redox titrations, for example. But most of the time, solutions are colorless. So we want to add a substance uh, that's going to give us a visual representation. We call that an indicator. An indicator is a substance that changes color right as we're approaching the equivalence point. Okay, and indicators are working on based, based on something called pH. Okay. Uh, the end point is the, the thing we can see. That's the point when the indicator actually indicates when it changes color. And so that's what we're going for. Ideally, if you do a really good tri titration, your end point should be the same as your equivalence point. That's really the skill involved in titration, is getting those two things exactly the same. And so that means you've got to have really good eyes, you've got to use a good indicator, and you have to look for color changes. Okay. So for a good titration, the reaction between the titrant, the thing you know, and the analyte, the thing you're analyzing, uh, you have to know what reaction happens between them. So you have to be able to write a balanced equation. Okay, You have to figure out where the equivalence point is going to be, and it has to be marked accurately. And then you have to know how much volume of titrant you've actually added. That has to be known uh, quite specifically. And so to, to do that, we use a specific piece of glassware called a burette. A burette is like a really long, skinny, graduated cylinder that's much more accurate. Um, it's accurate to the hundredth of a milliliter. And it has a valve at the bottom or something called a stopcock, which allows you to deliver small volumes at a time so that you can go very slowly. Okay. Uh, for most acid-based titrations, we use phenolphthalein, which is fun to say. Uh, phenolphthalein is a common indicator. It's typically used in acid-based titrations because it has a very marked color change. It is colorless uh, until all of the acid is gone. And then the instant your pH rises, goes into the base range, it turns pink. Okay, So that's what we're going to do. All right. So we're going to do two quick little examples of how uh, the math works in titrations. The first is we're going to standardize the solution. And so one of the things you've got to do first is you have to have a titrant whose concentration is very, very accurately known. And that's called standardizing it. So we're going to take this sodium hydroxide solution and we're going to standardize it with something called KHP. KHP is called potassium hydrogen phthalate. It is a solid. Okay, It's very unreactive in the air but it is an acid. It's monoprotic, which means for every mole of KHP that reacts, you get one mole of H plus ions. 
Okay? It's commonly used to standardize sodium hydroxide because it doesn't react with anything but the sodium hydroxide. And so since it's a solid, you don't have to worry about concentration, you just measure mass. Okay? So this, uh, this student is going to standardize some sodium hydroxide. And so she measures out 1.3009, measured on an analytical balance, grams of KHP. She dissolves it completely in water to make a solution and then titrates it with the unknown sodium hydroxide concentration. She measures the volume that it takes to dissolve and it takes, or that it takes to reach the endpoint. It takes 41.20 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide to reach the endpoint. And so now we're going to do some math to calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. It's just stoichiometry. So the first thing we need is the balance net ionic equation. Here's the equation. KHP has a very complex formula as you saw in the previous slide. Uh, we just abbreviated KHP. It's K plus and HP minus, okay? Uh, when, we, when we put this together, then we get rid of the uh, H plus and we get NaKP, which is the sodium potassium phthalate salt soluble, and then water, okay? And then the ultimate uh, net ionic equation then that we're going to work towards is that the hydroxide ion reacts with the KHP to produce water and KP minus, okay? That's our overall. So it's one to one. It's a one-to-one -one mole ratio of hydroxide ions to KHP, which is very handy. It makes the calculations easy. Okay, So the things we're going to do here is first find out how much H plus is in the KHP based on the mass that we used. How many moles of sodium hydroxide we used? Well, it's one-to-one, -one, so that's easy. And then the molarity of the sodium hydroxide. Okay, So we measured out 1.3009 grams. Molar mass of KHP is 204.22. And it's one mole of H plus per mole of KHP, so we have 0 0.0063701 moles of H plus. It's the same number of moles of sodium hydroxide needed because it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio. Okay, look back at the balanced equation to, to prove that. And then that means to find the molarity, we take the molarity, the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, and we divide it by the total volume of sodium hydroxide that we used, which was 41.20 milliliters or 0 0.04120 liters, and that gives us our concentration of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so now we know, and write that, you write that on the bottle's label right away, now we know the concentration of that sodium hydroxide to four significant figures. That's really accurate. So we can use that in any titration, and we'll always know its concentration, which we need to know for titration. Okay, so let's take that uh, 0.1546 molar sodium hydroxide, we're going to titrate a mixture this mixture contains an, a non-acidic compound carbon tetrachloride, CCL4, and benzoic acid, which is an acid. It's a weak acid. Okay? And we're going to use this, this uh, base that we just standardized to titrate this mixture. Now, the base is only going to react with the acid, with this, the, the benzoic acid. Okay? The rest of it, the CCL4, won't react at all. It's impurities. Okay, so we have this 0.3518 gram mixture, and we're titrating it with the sodium hydroxide. It takes us 10.59 milliliters of this base to, concept, to, to reach the endpoint. And so now we're going to figure out how much of my original 0.3518 grams is this benzoic acid. Okay, so let's do some calculations here. First, write the net ionic equation. It's just the benzoic acid that reacts with hydroxide, and we get water, and we get this benzoate ion. C7H5O2 minus. It's the benzoic acid without its proton. Okay, that's our net ionic equation. It's one to one, one to one mole ratio. Awfully convenient. Okay, find the moles of hydroxide used. Well, we know volume in liters times molarity, and then one mole of hydroxide per mole of sodium hydroxide gives us the moles of hydroxide used. Pretty easy. So now I know how many moles of hydroxide used. I also know that it's a one to one mole ratio of moles of hydroxide to moles of the acid. So I have the same number of moles of the acid. Now I find the grams of the acid using the molar mass, and then I divide that by the original mass of the total sample, and I have my percent composition, percent by mass. Okay, Common technique. So that sample that we used was only a little more than half of benzoic acid. The rest was impurities, that carbon tetrachloride. So that's another example of how you can use titration. In, in all cases, we need to know uh, very accurately one of the two components, and then we can use that information to find the other one. So we'll do a few different things. We'll standardize base. We'll do it at basic acid-base titration. We're going to do it on a small scale so that you can see you don't need to use a lot of big glassware and a lot of solutions. You can still get the same information. Okay.